All right. <clears throat> well, that's good to know. All right. Well, anyway, uh, tonight's program is based upon a book that I'm holding in my hand called A Hundred Birds to See in Your Lifetime, it's the book. And it's by David Chandler and Dominic Cousins. And this book was done, I think, in 19... To, with 2004 and then redone again a few years later. The uh, printing in 2004 is uh, significant and you'll find out why as we get closer. Uh, somehow I have the things on the left again. Are you having things the way you should? Um, at the top, on that top line uh, under your red line, there's a box that says resume slideshow. So I oh, yeah, I see that. I did it. There you go. Okay. All right. Very good. Anyway, the book is nice and interesting. Uh, it's, it's global. It's birds all over the world, but it has a bit of a bias in the sense that uh, it's, it's geared towards American uh, readers, I guess you might say. There are birds from all the continents, but I think if the book had been published in uh, Asia or Africa, the uh, birds in it would have been different, but that's fine for us because we're in America and uh, we're going to go through the 100 birds book, but we're not going to do 100 birds, don't panic. Um, I originally had this program with about 50 birds, but I had pictures for a little less, so I cut some out, we're a little less than 50, and I added a few in. And uh, that way, everything that I will talk about will be on the screen. Let's go to the first one. We're doing it as a countdown. And number 100 <clears throat> is the Arctic Turn. And one might say that the Arctic Turn looks like almost any other turn. Most turns look rather similar to each other. However, this bird is different than any other bird in the world really in that it has the migration. longest migration of any bird about 6, uh, 650,000 miles of migration during an average lifetime for an arctic turn that's about a million kilometers in one year an arctic turn let's say that nests in iceland will travel 11,000 miles from Iceland, they'll go south along the west coast, always over the ocean, along the west coast of Africa, around Cape Horn, to the west coast of Australia. And then uh, some will even go to the ice of Antarctica. So it's the longest migration of any bird in the world. And therefore, <coughs> excuse me, the Arctic Turn sees more daylight during a year than any other bird or any animal, as a matter of fact. And nearly all of its migration and its life is out over the ocean. And that's uh, Arctic Tern and Iceland. Now the pictures I'm showing are from a variety of sources. Um, many are from people who traveled with me on trips. Many are from uh, friends of mine. Um, so there's different pictures from different places. A few pictures I took also myself. The next bird, number 99, the Western Grieve. And uh, the two Greaves that you see during the courtship there, I hope they're not covered by faces and you can see everything. Um, <clears throat> the bird is a uh, bird that's a fun thing to see during its um, breeding and courtship the displays. Is. But to <coughs> excuse me. And barks read the register to intuit. What? Everything good? Okay. Any <coughs> everybody make sure you're muted except for Armis. Because I hear some background noise. Okay. okay. All right, we're we're back. So anyway, the um, Western Grebe for 100 years had a larger population because in 1986, part of the species became known as the Clark's Grebe. 
So it was described to science in basically 1886, and it managed to be the Western grebe for 100 years. And then since 1986, you have the Western grebe and you have the Clark's grebe in the Western US. Now we're skipping number 98, the common nightingale, but we're going to go to, uh, well, on my screen, part of the poor little vermilion flycatcher is covered. So I hope you can see it. If not, you get the idea. It really should be called the vermilion eyecatcher rather than flycatcher, but it's um, uh, certainly a nice thing to see. And in the Spanish speaking country, so I guess uh, one of the colloquial names for it is Brazito de Fu del Fuego, little ball of fire. And that's a good thing it has a Spanish name because the bird occurs as a resident throughout South America, south into Argentina. So it has a wide range, even though we think of it as being a Western bird in the US. The Siberian ruby throat is a bird that can occur in North America in uh, Alaska, but it's really got kind of a multiple personality. It occurs, of course, in Siberia too, and up north where it's uh, far from tropical, but half of the year it's in the Asian tropics, the Philippines and so on. Normally it's a skulker. It's not normally out on a leaf like that. And it's a songster, particularly through the night, like a nightingale or mockingbird in our country. Uh, the bird sings quite often at night. 94, the magnificent frigate bird, the largest and most widespread of the five frigate bird species in the world. This is a male. That's a female. And that's a young one on the left and the female on the right. And it takes about five years for a frigate bird to attain the adult male plumage. I didn't realize that. These pictures of frigate birds were photographed by a tour participant on one of our Ecuador tours along the west coast of uh, Ecuador, the Pacific Ocean. And uh, Marie Gardner's her name from uh, Delaware. Well, the rock ptarmigan, that is the world's most northerly wintering land bird designed to live where it's cold, as you can tell from the feathers around the feet there in the wild windswept places. This photograph was taken, I believe in Alaska, but this photograph was taken in October in Iceland. And probably the ptarmigan can be a contender for the best camouflage bird in the plumage changes throughout the year. It's unusual that the bird molts three times a year rather than the usual two, as in many birds. Um, one of the participants on one of our, uh, well, more than one of our trips over the years, he was a teacher from Ohio. He, he passed away young with a heart attack, but he made some nice drawings for me of uh, some of the birds on one of the trips we were on. And that's the male and female rock ptarmigan. Charles Gamble was his name. Um, he lived in Delaware for a while later. Uh, this was a photograph taken in Iceland of a rock ptarmigan, I guess a female in October. But no matter what month you're there, they, they can go from being completely white to brown basically. And um, there you go, the rock ptarmigan is uh, that bird was just doing a dust bath on the little path in front of us when we were there. The roseate spoonbill is a bird that we should all be familiar with here, being as we've had four of them in Delaware, Bombay Hook recently. It is one of, oh, I think it's six um, species of spoonbill, something like that in the world, but all the others are, are white. This one is um, either brightly, uh, pink or less brightly so, young birds are less so. Number 88, the red-billed scythe bill 
is a bird that uh, occurs from Venezuela south into Argentina and goes along the trees getting insects. It is not a woodpecker. It's in the group called wood creepers. And that's a rather, well, they're kind of like our sparrows. You have to get into it. Wood creepers can be a little bit, um, the page of wood creepers in the book you have to look at periodically because they uh, uh, are many similar. But what you do know a scythe bill when you see it, there's a red build, there's a black build, and there's a curved build. Uh, they all have curved bills, but they ran out of names, I guess. <laughs> okay, well, we're gonna skip the common cuckoo, the paradise tanager, the snowy sheath bill, and we're going to go now to 84, the greater flamingo. And uh, they occur from Spain and Sardinia, south through Africa for the greater and lesser flamingo. Many are in the Bahamas of the American flamingo, also on the Galapagos but, and, and Yucatan Peninsula. And at, down in the Andes, even as far south as uh, Tierra del Fuego, you have uh, a species of flamingo. And high in the Andes, the two rarest species of flamingos. So at one place in Argentina, you can see three species. But um, they have the longest legs and the longest neck in proportion to any bird in the world. And as I guess you've all read someplace, they get more color because of the brine that's in the salt that they are found in. They're, they're usually in very salty places. The rough. Well, <laughs> long time ago, when I was doing that bird line, we used to call Pedricktown, New Jersey. Uh, it's <laughs> industrial, <coughs> industrial parts now, and warehouses and Amazon and stuff. There's still a little marsh there. We used to refer to it as the rough capital of America. Every year in um, April, we'd get roughs there and people would go from the Philadelphia area to see roughs. They didn't look quite like the two roughs you see in this picture, not quite yet, but um, now people can go see a rough in our country and this area at Bombay Hook and other places on occasion. But at that time, Pedricktown was the prime place. There was a causeway there. Anyway, <coughs> excuse me. I should have a drink of water, but I don't have one. Um, the male rough is a bird like no other when it's dressed in its attire for display, as it does each year in the spring on mounds in a lek. And one time during one of the tours I led in Poland, I went to a place where there were multiple leks of ruffs. And the variety and plumages, it was really spectacular to see this when they're all together there uh, in the communal leks. Anyway, brown, black, white, orange, buff, rust, and golden are, are colors that they can have when they're displaying. The birds jump up in the air, flutter jump, and they hover. So uh, kind of exciting. Now, the rough is the name that we generally use, but it's not accurate completely because there's another half called the reeve. And that is a reeve no matter which way you look at it. Those two photos were taken here in this part of the world by Howard Eskin. He used to take a lot of photographs and uh, he passed away a few years ago. <clears throat> but he was um, from Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. Well, the book has the tufted puffin, but I'm sorry, I had to change it and put the Atlantic puffin, number one, because that's the bird that we would have in the Atlantic in our part of the world. But number two, I mean, how could you not include an Atlantic puffin? But at any rate, um, it's like a clown when you look at it in a way. It's... Um, well, there's a few things I can say about a puffin. I've been to where they nest and say in Iceland up on the top of the cliff, but you watch them when they go out, they're not good flyers. They kind of flutter and um, thank you. They kind of flutter a little bit and they're up high and then they go out and they feed all day on the, um, on the ocean. The trick to seeing puffins, you know, if you go to Iceland, that's an example. 
Well, not everybody's doing as much in the mail service as we used to, but they still sell a lot of postcards in Iceland. And I won't say every other postcard, but 25% of the postcards have puffins on them. And you would get the impression you could see puffins no matter where you go and what you do. But that's not true. You have to go to just the right places. And the best time to see puffins at their colonies is after you would have dinner, let's say at seven o'clock, you go up there at eight o'clock, nine o'clock, they're coming into the burrows and you can uh, see the puffins about as close as, um, well, I don't know, <laughs> just a few feet away from you about it. They're very tame. I did learn one thing. If you lie down on the ground near the puffin to take the picture, you're asking for trouble because so many birds are there they're funny little mites or bugs of sorts on the ground and you'll have all kinds of bugs bites. So I only did that once. But anyway, that's the clownish looking puffin. Lately, there's been an issue that's of, of, of concern in Iceland, for example. I don't know about Maine and Newfoundland where there are puffin colonies also, but the water temperature around Iceland of the ocean is going up a bit causing a difference in the fish that are there. And because of that, uh, the puffins are not reproducing as well as they should. So I'm afraid that there's some question as to how they're gonna be doing. It is now considered a threatened species and it wasn't a few years ago. And I think that's the prime reason for it. All right, we're gonna go past the way through the dipper, the musician wren and go to the scissor-tailed flycatcher and that's the state bird of Oklahoma. But no matter where you see one, if it's uh, one with a long tail and a little salmon, it's an impressive bird to see. Also impressive in Australia is the splendid fairy wren, which is people in, uh, most many people in Australia are familiar with these birds because they're rather tame. <coughs> this picture shows an adult male and then the others in the uh, group, as you can see, are, excuse me, part of the family. Okay, we're gonna skip the woodpecker finch, but we're going to go to the harlequin duck. Handsome drake, certainly one of the most attractive waterfowl. It's a bird of wild water. In the winter, white water by rocks along the ocean, but where they breed, as in Iceland, there are long streams, or in the Western US, the Pacific Northwest, rushing streams. Um, also areas where they feed on a lot of insects for around, around the rushing streams. Okay, we're going to skip the white plumed ant bird, but next is the greater roadrunner. Aha, this is a photo in Iceland, and that is um, the male and female of the harlequin duck. I forgot I had that. This is the Howard Eskin photo at Barnegat Light. And sometimes in New Jersey, you can see more than one Harlequin at one time. So there you go. Well, I said next is the greater road runner, but this is not a greater road runner. This is a lesser road runner. It's kind of like yellow legs. You have greater yellow legs and lesser yellow legs. The lesser road runner is more southerly. It occurs in Guatemala and southern Mexico, whereas the greater is north. And the two species both though are very similar. So it's a shame that one is a little um, considered less, but they both can uh, run, oh, I'm going to say something like 18 miles an hour on average, but they've re recorded up to 26 miles per hour. And they both, um, uh, feed actively on prey such as insects, scorpions, spiders, and lizards. So if you see a greater or a lesser, it kind of depends on where you are. Uh, they're very similar. Okay, going past the mannequin, and now we're going to the bohemian waxwing. Now that's a dapper bird, number 67 on this list. And it's a nomad in the winter, especially as you may know. Now, if you went up to a small town in New Hampshire, New London, New Hampshire, it's up above Lake Sunapee up there, pretty far north. And uh, you go to the Dunkin' Donuts, that building is the Dunkin' Donuts. 
And there's my wife standing outside looking up in the tree in the morning as I'm about to go in and get a coffee and she's looking up at the Bohemian wax wings. Well, that's the way you find them. When you're not quite expecting them, they can move about and um, often where there's a little more food that's visible than what you see there, but they certainly were getting food because we certainly, you don't just see one or two, you see 20, 30 or 40 at once. All right, next here is the broad-billed toady is one of five species of toady in the Caribbean. Uh, Jamaica, Cuba, Puerto Rico each have one. Hispaniola, Dominican Republic, that is, has two. The broad-billed toady is um, uh, more in the lower elevations where the narrow-billed is in the higher. But generally speaking, I don't want to say you've seen one toady, you've seen them all, they're so cute. But the thing is that uh, they all look basically alike, except the difference in the bill in the case of these two on Hispaniola. The jeer falcon. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, that is a bird that people really would, uh, if the word got out, when I did the bird line, there was an instance, for example, in 1982, where jeer falcons went to a quarry in Lancaster County. And in those days, it was a little tape recorder that would rewind and people would call in. There was no other way to get it. You, but in other words, only one person could get it at a time. And people were calling to get the latest on this jeer falcon. We were updating the information all the time. There were two that were out there. Yeah, you know, this quarry there, but uh, it's uh, it, it's it's a bird that even now, if a jeer falcon were to appear, you'd have a lot of birders on the scene. So they, it occurs around the world in the northern hemisphere and the far north. Uh, this picture is an Icelandic one. The next picture is one of the birds that is from Pennsylvania. Um, before I show you the picture, I'm just giving you a little heads up. It's an old black and white picture that my friend Alan Brady took of the female. One was a male and one was a female in Lancaster County. And that is the female and that's a picture he shot of that. Now you could still see this bird today. What? Yeah, you can still see this bird today. If you go to the visitor center, assuming it's open, at Middle Creek Wildlife Management Area. And they have specimens up above the, on, around the wall, up above you there. And this very bird, which died at the quarry, was uh, retrieved, and the specimen is now in that museum. Blue and yellow macaws. Nobody sees macaws in the tropics that they don't like. They're uh, kind of raucous, they're kind of colorful. It's kind of nice to see them in the wild and not um, that they're victims of uh, pet trade, but uh, the blue and yellow is mostly in Brazil. It's in a few other South American places, but mostly Brazil. That's the blue and yellow. But the, <clears throat> the biggest macaw, the one that came close to becoming extinct and is doing well now is the hyacinth macaw. And that's local in a part of Brazil. When I was with Amtrak years ago, I'd go to international travel trade shows and the Pantanal region of Brazil used to promote travel. There were, they didn't call it ecotourism in those days, but basically it was. They would have lodges there and they would have pictures of what you could see, the anteaters and the caimans and so on but they always uh, had pictures of the hyacinth macaw. And I think that bird basically got saved because it was worth more to the local people that people would come and stay at the lodge and eat the meals and have a tour instead of being captured. Uh, so many macaws uh, had their populations decimated with the capturing and then they were sent to Spain or other countries and a number of them would die in airplanes and so on. There were other macaws that were similar to this. The glaucous macaw, for example, did become extinct. 
the um, Lear's McCall, which is a smaller version, but looks like this one still exists at one place in Northeast Brazil. And the Spix's McCall also recently, the last Spix's McCall died, oh, a decade or two ago. Um, it didn't look good for that bird when it was down to one. So um, anyway, this is a nice success story in a way. I went extemporaneously on that one, but that's that's what that is. And of course, the, probably one of the most famous macaws is the scarlet macaw. This is in Costa Rica, for example, in Panama, and down through Brazil also. Uh, it's you can tell it's the scarlet macaw instead of the other one that's similar to it because it has the yellow. The one that's similar is called the red and green macaw. And uh, it doesn't have the yellow, but it has a lot of red. And uh, also has the blue, but uh, there you go. This is an odd bird to be in the list number 46, the uh, Smith's Longspur. Uh, basically, I guess they put it in the book because not many people see it. It breeds far north in the tundra and winters on the, um, in the Great Plains, but you, um, well, where it is, most of the time there aren't many people. This one particular bird was photographed in the 1990s at Island Beach, New Jersey. So that was a uh, long spur there at that time. Okay, let me see what the next thing is here. We are going down to, oh, I skipped the hoopoe, the one in the book is the Northern Carmine Bee Eater, which looks just like the Southern. And I had a picture of the Southern, so I put this in. This was from South Africa, this photograph. And um, generally, th there's only one bird in this picture, but generally they're in large colonies on river banks and so on, where there's a lot of dirt, like uh, kingfishers and holes. And they're very acrobatic, like swifts and swallows catching insects in the air. But um, if you're on an African trip, uh, the rollers, which are colorful, and the bee eaters, always a lot of oohs and ahs, even from people that are just there to see animals and don't necessarily have as strong an interest in birds, they all look at the bee eaters. That's a bird that you can't help but look at, I guess. Okay, now moving right along here to the owls. Of course, the snowy owl has probably the best uh, going for it in terms of publicity and people know about it and so on for a bird from the north, uh, a must see bird for many people, even now. Well, it's what <laughs> the story now is there's so much publicity on eBird and other places, they have to be careful about locations for snowy owl because you always get a lot of uh, people who try to take pictures. This is at uh, this is at Island Beach State Park also in New Jersey through the telescope there. And uh, there it is. But uh, everybody likes snowy owls and in the wintertime, it's a must see, as I said. But it's not the only owl from the north. These next two species are not in the book, but I had to include them. Not many people see the northern hawk owl. And uh, that's one that if the word got out, I haven't heard of so many in places like Vermont or Maine or upstate New York as I used to. This bird was photographed by me in 1979 at Amherst Island, Massachusetts. I went to Massachusetts. Amherst College is in Massachusetts. Amherst Island is in Ontario, I'm sorry. It's in the St. Lawrence River. You go up above the Thousand Islands. Amherst Island at the north end of Lake Ontario. Anyway, there was an incursion in 1979 of maybe 20 or so great gray owls. This hawk owl was there. Boreal owl was there. All the owls, actually, in addition to that, there were long ears, there were short ears, there were snowy, screech owl, and, um, and barred owl. So I made three trips. I, I was working afternoon shift at the time, finished work at 11. I would drive up to Ontario, see the owls, drive home, and I did it three times, but I was young. I was just out of college that I guess. So anyway, that is uh, Northern Hawk Owl. 
And uh, again, uh, a bird that we'd like to see. Now, I mentioned the great grays in the 19, oh, I guess there was the first incursion was 1979. And then there was another one, but not as big in around 82 or 83. But I haven't heard of much in Amherst Island ever since. But in 2017, a great gray owl, this is it, occurred in New Hampshire. And uh, again, uh, even though it's not in the book, it certainly is one that can draw a crowd. Now, bear in mind, we're talking about way up in New Hampshire where there's not many people. It's not like Delaware or Pennsylvania where there's so many of us. But look what happens. All those people there, that's, and I mean, it's not even near Boston, for heaven's sakes. Or that is, it's closer to Vermont, White River Junction. I mean, you know. And then all of those people were out looking at the great gray owl, kind of respectively keeping their distance. And the great gray owl was looking back at them. So uh, again, that was in March, the month of March in um, 2017. When things like that happen, uh, sometimes there's a problem because things occur on land that belongs to somebody. This wasn't at a public park or a place, a wildlife refuge or anything like that. It was on somebody's land. So people had to really um, make arrangements with the landowner and say, look, there's gonna be people coming here and then the landowner has to cooperate. So fortunately it all worked out. And I guess the bird stayed for a couple of weeks and that's what it looked like when I got there, but I didn't go there the first few days. I went there maybe um, a week into it. So uh, if you can imagine those cr that number of people for a week or two weeks, that's a, that's a draw. Well, the Ross's gull. This Ross's gull that you see here, and you can see a tinge of pink in the picture. This was <laughs> a bird that I saw in Tokyo, Japan during one of my trips there in the 1990s, I forget what year, but the early 90s. And it drew a lot of Japanese birders. Birding was starting to become more popular in Japan at that time. And I guess it's still popular now, but their prime uh, implement or, or whatever they would carry the, with them are not binoculars, cameras. Even when I was birding last in Japan, Boy, the cameras would be up and they'd be flicking, flicking, flicking. And then they would look in the camera and then they'd see what, oh, this is like on a pelagic trip. They'd see what the birds were. They never looked at the birds. They only took pictures. But anyway, that's basically the Japanese approach to it. And uh, that's a sideline. Um, I had grandparents that lived, oh, they lived well into their almost 100, into their 90s, up in Massachusetts. And I guess it was in 19, oh, I can tell you this as a matter of fact, I wrote it down here. 1975, the first Ross's gull in the Northeast appeared at Newburyport, Massachusetts. There was a long concrete wall by the harbor and that bird had a full page in Time Magazine. Now today, a full page in Time Magazine would be 25% of the magazine almost, but in those days, Time Magazine was thick and there was a nice uh, article in it. And of course the New York Times and all the newspapers, this bird drew birders from all over the place. And that was there. Another one occurred in 1990 in Maryland at a sewage treatment plant. And I don't know if you know the book by um, Peter Dunn, the Feather Quest, but on page 82 in that book, well, there's a chapter in the book about the Ross's gull at this plant, water treatment plant in, near Baltimore. And on page 82, he has a conversation with me about the bird. We're there and I'm telling him, oh, this is not a bad place as far as a sewage treatment plant. But I looked at the book and I thought, I, was, I wasn't there. I never talked to Pete Dunn at that place. What happened? So when I saw Pete, I said to him, well, what, how did you get a, a whole dialogue that we did? And he said, well, it made a good story, didn't it? 
So that was a funny thing. And I always remember that. But the, the, again, that drew a real crowd. Um, Churchill, Manitoba, for a while in the 1980s, had uh, a couple pairs, I guess, of, Ro of Ross's gulls that nested there. But that hasn't been the case since. OK, well, the next bird is the cocktail tyrant, which is a little South American flycatcher. Um, the new capital, it occurs in like a, uh, well, the, the name is Cerrado for the habitat. It's not desert exactly, but it's a brushy type of habitat. And the new capital in Brazil, which was made in 1960, believe it or not, Brasilia, was in the middle of this Cerrado. And in the 1980s, I was in Brasilia and I just walked out into the fields and the brush and I saw my first cocktail tyrant. I never forgot. They go up about 300 feet in the air and do a flight display and it's a marvelous bird. So uh, it's a threatened species now because it's uh, a lot of birds are threatened for various reasons. Not necessarily just the lack of habitat, but the alteration of that and habitat is, is a primary reason. Okay, so, well, it looks like a bird, but it has the um, digestive system of a cow, basically. The Hawatson, this is a bird of the Amazon, is almost always near water. It's in the bushes and the brush. They say in the book, but I don't know this for sure, but they say that it stays in one area its whole life. Some people even say in one tree its whole life, but I don't know about that. The bird doesn't fly very well at all. It can't walk at all. It's the bird where the young one has a claw that hangs on. It, it's, it's, a, it's a whole different uh, type of thing. But the reason I said it's like a cow, it eats these leaves. And in the esophagus, it takes two days or so for the fermentation for the uh, leaves to be digested. And uh, as I said, the bird doesn't walk, but it tends to lean forward. It's an odd creature. Its <laughs> nickname is Stinky Pheasant, but it's nowhere near a pheasant. The bird most, well, <laughs> the closest thing to a Hawatson is a cuckoo. It's closely to, close to the cuckoo family. All right, the umbrella bird, its head a little bit like an umbrella, I guess at the top was the idea. The long wattled umbrella bird is the rarer of the two. The Amazonia is more widespread. And this is found in the dense jungle of Ecuador is where that picture was taken. Also in Ecuador, the Andean cock of the rock, they do um, displays that are quite incredible, really. Um, a bit like mannequins. They jump up and down on the twigs and the, this goes on and on and on. But this Andean cock of the rock is in the uh, mid elevations in the Andes and Peru, Ecuador and so on. And that's always a treat or a major thing to see on the um, trips that we did there. Well, the superb larbird, talking about a bird that's like a pheasant, but it's not a pheasant either. This bird confused people for a long time. It's an Australian bird, and it, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it makes uh, kind of, a, 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 well, a unique kind of a nest, I'll put it that way, and uh, on a, the mound and so on, They're kind of like a bowerbird, but a little different. It is, a bird that can mimic almost anything. In fact, they say that it mimics almost all the uh, Australian birds that occur in its territory. So if you think you're hearing a kookaburra or a whip bird or something, uh, many times <laughs> all of that can come out of the mouth of this bird. But what I started to say that's a little odd about it is that it's actually a passerine. It's the largest songbird or passerine of all the birds in the world. And it has this incredible display that it can do. And um, I had a person with me on one of the Australia trips that couldn't walk very much. He was elderly. And uh, we went up to a parking lot and I was so happy because he was waiting for us in the car as we were walking around. 
And when he was waiting, a lyre bird came out on the parking lot and uh, he had a, certainly a good look at that. Well, this picture is, um, it might not be as clear as some of the pictures taken today. This was taken in 1990, high in the Andes in Chile. And um, that was our first Focus on Nature tour, November 1990. And we were up in the high Andes and Alan Brady, he's deceased now from Bucks County. He, uh, he took that picture of an Andean condor. So that's uh, on the list. What's not on the list is a bird that was mentioned earlier in the meeting. And I have to show this picture. That is in 1982, all of the condors that were in the wild were captured. And right before that was done, I photographed this California condor north of a place called Ojai in California, in um, the mountains north of Los Angeles. And uh, that's my photograph, 1982 of a wild California condor before they were all uh, brought in and then they started the program. Uh, there was a, I don't know if any of you know, he lived in Chester County back then. And then he moved to California, his name was Jesse Grantham. And uh, he was uh, a biologist of sorts, I guess. And um, he took me up to where this bird was when he had moved out to California. He had two children. <laughs> Their names were Ocean and Sunshine. And I'll never forget California in the 80s, I guess you might say. The kids weren't wearing clothes, just running around ocean and sunshine. But anyway, having said all that, a few years later, this bird was during one of our trips at the Grand Canyon. And, um, oh, I guess this was 2000. I have a note here to, so I could tell you. 2014. Now, just to give you a little sense on this, the total population when the California condor was captured, the last one in 1987, I photographed what you saw in 1982, 22 birds were in the wild. And then at the Grand Canyon, when this bird was taken in 2014, there were about 440 no, I'm wrong. The, the, in 2010, there were 100, 100 uh, condors, 73 of which were in Arizona at the time. And then a couple of years later, the census indicated 440 birds total with 225 in the wild and 220 in captivity. So that's a story of a bird that has managed not to uh, disappear and go away. Well, this is a bird that's normally high in the Andes in uh, Peru, for example, about 15,000 feet above sea level. We had a trip there, uh, I don't remember, 1987. And some people, when we parked in the parking lot up there, weren't feeling good. So I stayed with them because I had to make sure, sometimes if you get elevation sickness, you have to get people down quickly. So I stayed with them and those people who went to see the bird, I forfeited it at the time. They went across the field, down the mountain habitat there to see this bird. That was the reason we were up there so high. And then when they came back, those that were coming back from that venture, they weren't walking. Some of them were on their hands and knees coming back. I'll never forget it. However, in Chile, you don't have to go up to 16,000 feet. You can see it at a place two hours out of Santiago at about 8,000 feet. And that's where this bird was photographed as this one. And uh, we'd see it every year on our Chile trips there, but it was a little tricky. And sometimes you had to walk through a cold stream or something to get to the right place. But um, the diadem sandpiper plover, that was kind of an enigmatic bird, I guess you might say. 
Okay, the next thing here, also spectacular to see, are the red crown cranes. Now, red crown crane is the appropriate name, that's the proper name, but there's the Japanese crane and the Manchurian crane, and there's about an equal number of those. Manchurian cranes are in the mainland of uh, Northeast, basically Northeast China and Siberia, adjacent Siberia. The red crowned crane in Japan, the Japanese crane, is only on the northernmost island of Hokkaido. And you go there in the wintertime and uh, they gather up in the afternoon at places where the Japanese walk out and they put little fish on the snow and the birds go there to eat. And then as you go through the winter, we usually would go to Japan in February because A, the days are getting a little bit longer. Uh, it gets dark. 3.30 in the afternoon and uh, because of the time zone there uh, in the winter time. And if you can get an extra hour and keep till 4.35 o'clock, it's just good to have more time instead of less because you have to get from one thing to another. But anyway, uh, you go to these places there and you have these experiences of seeing the cranes. I've been there in the um, summer also when they have their young. And then later they come back in the year, they come back to these places where they feed them. And normally there's two adults and one young and they do dancing and they do calling. And that's the uh, red crowned crane. That's quite spectacular. Now, the first time I went there to Hokkaido and saw the Japanese crane was in 1982. Oh, I meant to say this. Uh, there's a river nearby. It's a relatively shallow river. But after the birds feed, they go to spend the night in the water. They stand in this cold water all night, basically, is what they do. And then um, Hokkaido, don't misunderstand. Hokkaido, it's, it, I got, how should I tell you? If you go up to Maine or the, let's say Maine, in the wintertime, it's cold normally. I mean, it's not as cold now as it was a few years ago. but it's cold enough. Hokkaido's colder than that. Normally, the temperature in Hokkaido in the winter, when I've been there, it's around zero to 10. When the sun's out shining, it might get up to about 20 in the, for a peak, but at nighttime goes down to zero. It's a cold place, even though it's the same latitude as, well, Labrador and England, but it, it's, it's cold because of the way the ocean currents are. But anyway, having said that, uh, my first time there, I went by myself and I got off the plane. I rented the car, drove on the left side of the road, drove up the road. I had no idea where I was going to see a Japanese crane, but I wanted to. And then I looked and there was one out in the field. And that's a picture of the first crane that I saw back in 1982. Now in 1982, let me tell you, the total population on Hokkaido was 320. Later, 2012, the total Japanese population is up to about 1,160. In other words, four times as many. Um, I don't think the area can support much more than that, but it's another success story where the bird has increased over the last few years and now maintaining its own. Now, the rarest, Japan's interesting in the winter. You can go to Japan and see half the species of cranes that occur in the world. There's 15 species of cranes and I've seen seven of them in Japan. The rarest being the Siberian crane, which would occur there as a vagrant. It hasn't the last few years. The Siberian crane, total population is about 3000 birds, 95% of which winter in China. Now I showed you earlier a drawing that uh, Charles Gamble did of the ptarmigan. He did this one of the whooping cranes. The whooping crane, in 1941, there were only 21 in the wild. 19, excuse me, in 2017, there were about 500 whooping cranes in the Gulf Coast of Texas in the winter. And now, of course, there's, uh, I shouldn't say of course, 
but there are actually whooping cranes that are nesting in places like Wisconsin and so on. So that's another story. The three species of cranes that we just shared together, the red crowned, the Siberian, and the uh, whooping crane are the three rarest cranes in the world. All three are, are, are the very rare. By the way, the most common of all the world's cranes, the 15 species, by far the most common is the one that we see on occasion uh, around here, the sandhill crane. The oil bird it used to be that you would go to a place in Trinidad and um, <laughs> there was a cave there and three o'clock in the afternoon, you could go in the cave and see a few oil birds. I went there. My first trip I ever took was by myself again to, to a foreign place was 1977. I went to Trinidad and I was all set to go to the oil bird cave and there was a doggone bellbird up in the tree that kept going kabong, kabong. And I had, I, it's hard to see the bellbird until you do. And so I kept looking for the bellbird and then I never saw the oil birds. But in 1987, I went to this place and uh, I'd have to think of Tingo Maria was the name of it in, in Peru. 25,000 oil birds were in this cave during the day and they would fly out at night and the bats would fly out after the parrots and so on went in. And anyway, uh, the oil bird, it's a bigger bird than uh, Whippoorwill or Chuckwill's widow, bigger than that. But it, even though it's out at night, it doesn't eat insects like most birds that fly around at night do like, um, Nighthawks and whippoorwills and so on eat insects. Uh, it eats fruit, only fruit, and it can fly 25 miles normally at night away from the neck of the, the cave or the place where it would roost, which would be in a cave or a grotto that the sun never goes to. And uh, sometimes they've been known to go as much as 90 miles away. Uh, to feed and then go back. So they do cover, like the bats that go out of the caves in Texas at night, they do cover a lot of area. Now this cave at Tingo Maria, when we were there, that was when there were problems with the, what do you call them, Shining Path in Peru. And uh, I guess it was about two weeks or a month after we were there, two British birders were murdered there. Not at the cave exactly, but in the area close to there. So the oil bird though was a fantastic experience to see thousands of them coming out. That's my story on that and I'm sticking with it. The next story I have, gosh, almost every bird I show there's a story. The wall creeper. The wall creeper is actually related to the nuthatch. It's in the nuthatch, almost nuthatch family, I guess you might say. It occurs in let's say, um, Oh, from Afghanistan, forget that, but west through the mountains and Romania, Bulgaria, and as far west as Spain and the Pyrenees. And we were in the Pyrenees, and you look on this cliff, big cliffs, where you're told, oh, this is a good place for a wall creeper. Uh-huh. Looking and looking and looking. And I saw something up there, and I thought, oh, I got to put the scope on this. This bird is six inches long. Uh, that's all. What I put the scope on was a man that had the same color clothing as the wall creeper. And I realized six feet, six inches, there's a big difference. It's very hard to find these things. So we were at a place in a gorge. The road was uh, narrow. The gorge was narrow. Down below, there was a rushing stream and up above a high cliff. And we were all looking above. All our faces were looking up for the wall creeper. And then I looked down and the nest was right below me. And I thought, oh my goodness, there's the wall creeper down there. And then I turned around and there was a crew coming from the BBC, a David Attenborough crew. And I said, the wall creeper's down below, don't look above. And they were so thrilled that I showed them that and then it made the BBC. So that was a story with the wall creeper. Oh, they say, oh, I don't know who they is, but this is what I was told years ago, that the most beautiful bird in the world if you can see it in the good sunlight, is the resplendent quetzal. And I don't know if you know this bird or not, but it occurs in Central America, basically Guatemala, Costa Rica, Panama. And it is really very beautiful iridescence. One thing about it, I don't know if you can tell from that picture on the right, but 
it has what looks like a very long green tail. However, that's not the tail. The tail is what's white. And this long thing that flows behind, as in this graphic on the left, they're actually wing feathers that are out. And the tail, as you can see in that, what you see there on the left, <laughs> there's a chain of gas stations in Guatemala called Quetzal. And they had this uh, there and you see Quetzal, that's on their money, it's on a lot of things. But anyway, that's the uh, resplendent Quetzal, the national bird of Guatemala. One of the most beautiful birds I've ever seen is the fairy pita in Southern Japan. And any pizza that you can see, number six we're down to already, is uh, is beautiful. But the fairy pita is basically uh, sometimes can be a little hard to see, but if you're patient and stand still, um, you, you can. Okay, number three, we're really getting to the end of this, and that is uh, the ones that are ranked highest. Very locally in Peru and one particular area, the marvelous spatula tail. Now to get to that marvelous spatula tail, you had to go up a long winding road. This is looking down from a high elevation on the road. There's no car on it, uh, but if there were a car, I mean, that's not a walking trail, that's a highway. And uh, you, it, it's, well, you could tell here, you're up pretty high and that's beautiful country. And inside on the wall, they have a picture of one. Outside on the building, they have a picture of one. And there is the real thing. That's the male resplend uh, marvelous spatula tail. It's not the only hummingbird in the area. So I just threw a couple other things in here for fun that are up in the highlands of Peru. This, at the same place, we saw the sword-billed hummingbird and uh, that's a nice thing to see. And it's got that long beak or bill, I guess you might say, that can go into the flowers to feed where other birds can't. The sparkling violet ear, the white necked jacobin, and the rufous crested coquette. And that's one of my favorite birds. And you can see why in that picture. Now, I said at the beginning of this program, that uh, well, number two, I would mention, which we're not having a picture of here. It's a bird of paradise from New Guinea. Number one, and let me get back. I said at the beginning of this program that it was significant to me when this book was written because in 2004, people thought that they had rediscovered the ivory-billed woodpecker. The ivory-billed woodpecker, this photograph is one of the last photographs taken of ivory-billed woodpeckers, Arthur Allen's picture from the Singer track in Louisiana in 1935. But um, in Arkansas in 2004, there was a flurry of activity when people went to look for ivory-billed woodpeckers. And now, unfortunately, well, by 2009, they looked for five years. Um, and they never really found it again. Why well, should I shouldn't even put again there because we're not 100% sure they found it in the first place in 2004. But having said all that, as you probably heard in the news recently, this is one of the species that unfortunately is now said to be extinct. And uh, in the book, it's the number one bird to see, but I'm afraid nobody's going to. Anyway, this is a painting that Mark Catesby did of an ivory-billed woodpecker in 1722. So there you go. That was shortly after, of course. That was even before it had a scientific name by Linnaeus, as a matter of fact, but 1722. Now, another bird that is said to be um, uh, extinct now is the Bachman's warbler. I never knew anybody that saw a um, uh, ivory-billed woodpecker, but I do know one person who did see the Bachman's warbler and he was from Delaware County. I don't know if you know this person, he's gone now. He worked for Northwest Airlines at uh, the airport, Johnny Miller from Tinicum. And uh, he went to the Carolinas and saw the Bachman's warbler in the 1950s. 
and uh, well, we learned about that. But at any rate, uh, that's uh, gone. But I want to turn around the end of this to something more positive, if I may. And that is a success story here. This is a Kirtland's warbler. And this was seen earlier this month for about a week in Baltimore, Maryland. Went down to see the Kirtland's that was there. And well, when they made this, I've made a couple notes on this that's interesting. When the Endangered Species Act was first, uh, well, it, there was two creations, but the first creation of the Endangered Species Act was in 1966. This was one of the first birds that was put on it, 1967, the Kirtland's warbler. There were, in 1987, 167 males, that's all. And the history of it is kind of funny too. The bird was first discovered in the Bahamas. And then, and when it was described to science, it was only known from one specimen. In the, around 1860 something, it was known only by four birds, only knew four of them. As the century continued, we think of this as being a bird from Michigan, but all of those sightings were in Ohio. And it continued in Ohio until uh, I guess, uh, oh, I forget what year it was now, but towards the uh, end of the century, they were in Ohio. Now, the Kirtland's warbler has spread and increased and it's no longer on the endangered species list. And it nests in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Ontario. And it has been seen as a migrant or vagrant in, um, Florida, and of course, I just mentioned Baltimore, Maryland recently. Um, it was thought that it, they all wintered in the Bahamas, but they've been found on the Turcos and Caicos Islands, and more recently, but not many, in the Dominican Republic. So this was the bird. Again, it's a young bird. You can see the white eye ring. And you can see the, uh, uh, the, the coloration of the back and stuff indicates that it's a young bird of the year. Anyway, um, the day that I went there, it was at a little park, not too far from I-95, not too far from the Baltimore Harbor. The park had a baseball field, a row of bushes, a little bit of uh, Phragmites, and it was next to the water. And that was it. I mean, it was a tiny little park. The birds stayed there. There were about 50 or so people there when I saw this. My wife took these pictures, by the way. But anyway, there were about 50 or so people there, and they all kept their distance. And um, that was, uh, but I did want to share with you about this. There's an interesting thing. I read about the Kirtlands, and <laughs> oh my. Um, I don't know how many of you, maybe you never heard of this, but the crime of the century in the 20th century was committed by two men who murdered a young son, 14 year old boy, who was um, the son of two wealthy people and they had wanted to get a ransom. Well, anyway, what's the fellow's name? Nathan Leopold. Nathan Leopold was a teenager in Chicago, and he became, now this was back in the beginning, 1920s or something like that. Now let's say 1920-ish. And he became very interested and he became, because he went up to the Jack Pine area of Michigan and he studied these things as a college student. He became at that point, like the authority, he knew more about the Kirtland's Warbler than anybody else, this young, teenager, late teens, but teenager. And uh, he wrote a big report about it and everybody in the scientific world was impressed with what he did. And he turned out to be one of the two that murdered this boy later on. And as I said, it was the crime of the century. And uh, if you Google it, you'll find it's quite a story. There's another story to it that what goes around comes around. Um, 
when I was, uh, went into the DVOC, you had to be nominated or uh, by two people to get in and a teacher, he's gone now, Bob Seal from Northeast Philadelphia was one of the people who nominated me. And he told me a story I never forgot. He went to Puerto Rico and he was on the bay on the water in a boat with a person that wrote a book about the birds or the checklist of the birds of Puerto Rico. And Bob Seal was down there to look for a lesser black back gull. And he was alone on this boat. And what happened was with this one man that he went out with. And when he got back, he later learned that the man he was on the boat with was the man that I'm talking about that as a boy was interested in the, uh, as a youngster was interested in this warbler. He had been in jail, paroled in 1958. And uh, Bob was a little shooken up that he was alone with them, but basically he went and became a, the, after he was paroled from jail, he became a um, doctor, worked on leprosy and became a very enthusiastic birder in Puerto Rico. I guess he lived in Puerto Rico because it was a better place to be than the United States. Anyway, I just have a couple more things quickly. Birds that should have been on the list, the Scarlet Ibis, Unfortunately, you can't go to Venezuela the way we used to go there, but uh, that's in Trinidad and Brazil. People sometimes say to me, what's your favorite bird you've ever seen? Well, the stellar sea eagle on Hokkaido, that cold islands in Japan I told you about. The largest owl in the world, the blackest and fish owl is also there. It's also the rarest owl in the world. And then on the Galapagos, there's the waved albatross, but you don't have to go to the Galapagos. There's one island, Isla de la Plata, on the, along the west coast of Ecuador. You can take a boat there. And there's two pairs of this bird on that island. And we were allowed to go up and see the waved albatross. That should be in the book. Um, another bird that uh, it, it, <laughs> a must-see bird for a lot of people would be the blue-footed booby. And if you're not sure from that picture that the bird has blue feet, it does. But look at this picture, the two blue-footed boobies. They look as if they're quite similar, but there's one thing you might notice that's different, the eye. One bird has a larger black pupil and one bird a smaller pupil. Well, the one that has the most yellow is the male and the female has the most black. So that's how you can tell the blue-footed boobies apart. We were in a restaurant along the coast of um, Ecuador having our meal. And this was the view of the blue-footed boobies. If there's a lot of birds diving into the water, there must be a lot of fish in the water there. And I'm going to end with this. Uh, sometimes good birds come to you and you don't have to go far in the way, way, uh, far away to see them. And uh, this was a dove key that my wife photographed at Indian River Inlet in Delaware this year in January. And again, the dove key or little auk, as it's also known, is normally way far north, and we wouldn't go to those places easily where it is. So sometimes the birds come to us, and I hope you've enjoyed the program and a look at birds at different places in the world. That's it. <laughs>